together in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're in Matthew chapter 5. You'll see the words on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and pull them out and, and keep them there. We'll, we'll be in this text all morning. So uh, five, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27, says this. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than the whole body go to hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Show of hands, who likes going to the dentist? There are four of you. Um, a lot of us uh, dread going to the dentist, but we want the benefits of it. We want the clean mouth. We want the, the teeth that don't fall out, all of the things that, that are, are a part of that. Um, this this morning is not going to the dentist, but it, it may feel like that. It's a tough topic, it's tough topics, multiple topics this morning. Um, and I think they can feel uh, like, oh, man, I don't know if I want to enter and engage in, in, in that conversation or, or hear what God's Word has to say about that because of the of how we've grown up, of the culture that we live in that has, has taken things that are of the Lord, that are creational and part of what it means to be a human being, um, and has, has, has taken them, and, and we've seen corruption, we've seen uh, discouragement, we've seen fear, we've seen all sorts of things um, invade and corrupt and, and change these things of the Lord such that it feels like to even broach the conversation is fraught with fear and danger. <laughs> I hope uh, as we just hit them on a cursory way this morning and the conversations that follow, where we'll end up is, is with a thankfulness, a gratitude that um, we don't have to wonder, that we don't have to live in the dark, that we don't have to fear or be concerned. We can celebrate what God's true and real design is for these things. Um, and then how it works itself out in our life and practice. And hopefully, more than anything, like every week, that we'll see, it'll help us to see Jesus as more beautiful in his way as, as, the, as the way. Um, part of the reason this is a tough, these are tough topics um, is because the, the stance of what the scriptures say on them is countercultural. And so we feel like we're running upstream as we teach what the Bible teaches about it. Um, part of it that makes it hard is the, the sensitivity that we as individuals feel with these sorts of topics because of our own failure and the guilt that's associated with it or because we've been sinned against in some of these areas. And so they are, are very sensitive. We've all got these complex stories when it comes to the topics of adultery and marriage, divorce and lust. Those are, are difficult. They can be difficult topics. Um, and it's, it's, it's even more complicated for me personally because I'm a, a, a fellow pilgrim that struggles just like you do. And last week with anger, this week with lust, uh, next week with truth and integrity and then generosity and money and prayer and judging. These, <laughs> I wrestle with all these things as I know you do. And so anything that I say is not as as somebody that's got it all figured out, but somebody that's wrestling just like you are. And so let's, let's engage with what God has to say about these things, knowing that I'm not going to say all that needs to be said, but let's continue these conversations as, uh, as a family, especially if you're visiting. <laughs> and you walked in this morning and you're like, here it is. The pastor's going to talk about lust and adultery. And, you know, we're taking God's word through the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what we've said. As we've uh, approached this, this sermon. This is Jesus' uh, the consolidation of Jesus' teaching that he probably gave on multiple accounts. And the, the linchpin, the key verse to unlock it all, 
is, is the first passage that we took where Jesus says, I am going to be, I am the fulfillment of the, all the law and the prophets. So he, he's kind of giving a, a heads up, a clue to all that's going to come in this sermon. He's going to say, hey, I'm going to shine light in all of these different areas that, 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 that I care about. And yet the, the, the key to every one of them is that I am the fulfillment of it. That you've heard it said one thing, one way to live, and I'm going to take it even deeper and point you to the fulfillment of it, uh, the fruition of it in, in him. So as we talk about these topics and the topics to come, um, as we think about even what we dealt with last week with anger, um, it's, it's going to be key for us to remember this is not just one more moral teaching. It's not just the same difference that others are living in in the world. Jesus is setting something very different in front of us. He's saying, hey, you can only approach engaging this area of your world in, in any sort of semblance of, of, of the way you were meant to if you're in a relationship with me. He's going to show himself as the fulfillment of it. So we're going to do what we did last week, and in the weeks to come, we're going to look at two things. What is at the heart of this issue, and how does Jesus fulfill it? That's, that'll be our rhythm as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. So let's look. What is at the heart I should say of these issues, but of, of, of this issue dealing with marriage and sexuality um, and all the things that stem from that. Um, one way to get at it is, is to think about it like this. Uh, Scott reminded me um, a year ago, was it a year ago? Like, yeah, that Anthony and I went um, down to, uh, I was asked by a friend of mine who's also a, 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 a state representative um, to come be the chaplain of the day for the state legislature um, downtown. I even wore a tie, and that's the, actually the point I was made. I dressed up. I wore a suit, tie. Um, yep, I have one, believe it or not. Um, it, I never do that, as you can tell by the responses um, uh, from these guys. It, it's, it's abnormal. Why? Why did I dress up? Because when you enter that building, that, there's something different about that, that venue, about that place, about what's going on there, that you don't just handle it the way I, you, you would. You don't just dress the way you would. You don't just act the way you would um, in, in other areas of your life. Uh, it's something special, something set apart, something that's important that's going on there. Um, think about it this way. I had a friend uh, who was a, um, a youth intern at a church, a very traditional downtown church in Augusta, Georgia. And he was playing around um, one, one day during the week, <clears throat> and he got in the pulpit, and he was mimicking the head pastor, just kind of just being silly, being funny. <clears throat> and he got called in the office next, the next day because the head pastor happened to be in the hallway listening and watching him do this. And, the, I mean, this is not right, but the head pastor was ready to fire him. Why? Now, I don't condone that. I don't think that was the right response, and, and ultimately they worked it out. But why? Well, because that place was important. And he was, in some ways, making light of it, of what happened at the, the place where God's word had gone forth so faithfully for over 200 years and, um, and, and that, that sort of thing, right? So there was something different that he was asking him to treat that place, that space, um, differently than what he would normally. Uh, the same kind of idea of if you were passed down some sort of family jewelry. You treat it different than you would something you got from a gum machine. You, you, you're going to protect it. You're going to put it in a safe place. You're going to uh, care for it in ways that you might not something else. Why? Because of the, the power of it. Because of the special place that it holds in your heart. Because of, of the, the, the potential for it. It is precious. It's valued. It's protected. That's what Jesus does when he comes to the idea of marriage the institution of marriage, and all of the things that would threaten it. He's wanting to say, hey, when you come here, the reason I'm going to say the things in the way I'm going to say them about this is because it's extremely powerful, extremely important. You can't just act the way the world does as it approaches marriage and the things of it. What is he going to say? Well, three things at least. God's design is covenant over consumer. God's design is complete and not a partial commitment, and God's design is limiting because it's loving. So we're going to look at those things really quickly. First, God's design is covenant over consumer. I borrowed heavily as I studied this week 
from, surprise, surprise, Pastor Tim Keller. If you want to listen to a sermon on this topic that is exhaustive and well done, go listen to his, his sermon online on this. But he makes the distinction, and it's extremely helpful, one, that God's design is covenant over consumer. What is a covenant? Well, a covenant is this binding relationship that God enters into with his people. It's, it's both more than a relationship, although it's definitely that, and it's more than just binding, right? You can fall off on that either side. It's something that is, is a binding, uh, uh, contractual type of a thing, but it's, it's also steeped in, in relationship and knowledge of one another. It's, it's a relationship that's more, that the relationship's more important than just my individual needs inside of the relationship. The commitment and the, and the, the binding nature of it um, makes it that if my my needs aren't being met just like I want them, or if it's if it's I'm not happy all the time, that I stick with it because it's more than just me and my needs. It's very different than a consumer relationship, right? A consumer relationship is is more the vendor and a product. Somebody is providing something, and you are deciding whether or not it's meeting your needs. And if I'll I'll participate in it, I'll, I'll benefit from it as long as it's meeting my needs. And when it stops meeting my needs, I'll go find something better. That's a consumer relationship. It's where my needs are more important than the relationship. The relationship's just there to serve me and my needs. A covenant is this binding relationship that provides these boundaries of safety. It provides these, these, this, this deeper opportunity for feelings that go beyond just the surface or the physical that over time develops this, this intertwining of the parties that are involved. It provides this freedom. That if I don't perform in whatever ways that, that I want to, that this person's not going to leave me for somebody else. That it's more important than just the needs of the individual because we've committed to one another in a covenant relationship. God calls marriage a covenant relationship. It's not consumer. It's covenant. And because of that, there is... is is, is great consequence for not keeping it. Um, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, he's going to say it's so much more than that. There's a covenant relationship. When he talks about adultery and lust and the things that come out, out of that, he's, he's saying, hey, let's talk about sex in the, relation, in the context of marriage. That it is, it is not a consumer good. It's not meant to be a consumer good. It's meant to be a covenant good. It's meant to be enjoyed in the context of marriage. It's meant to be um, uh, worked out in those safe, deeper feelings, free sorts of ways that cannot ever be in a consumer relationship that doesn't have the bounds of marriage surrounding it. So that's the first thing. God's design is covenant over consumer. Secondly, God's design is complete not partial commitment. It kind of flows out of that first idea, but God's design is complete, not partial commitment. In other words, when you enter into a marriage relationship, um, <clears throat> you're being called to give your whole self to the other person. When pre in premarital counseling, we talk about it, it's not, it's not the idea of the world where in a marriage it's you give 50 and I give 50 and we become 100% together. No, it's, it's this weird thing that happens where you give 100%. And I give 100%, and together it becomes 100%. It's a new kind of math, right? The two become one flesh. You give your whole self so that sex becomes this, it, hear what I'm saying? I'm not saying sex is a sacrament, but I'm saying it's sacramental in the sense, what does a sacrament do? A sacrament is an outward sign of an inward reality. So sex becomes sacramental inside the bounds of a covenant marriage relationship in that it is it is a physical sign of something that's giving of your whole self. Something much deeper that's going on there in that relationship is a complete commitment. So that sex outside of that relationship, whether it's adultery or, or anything, any other form of sexual immorality, is, is this sense of it's, 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 it doesn't have integrity. You're only giving this one little piece of you and you're, you're, you're freeing yourself of the whole commitment that God had designed in the relationship of marriage. And then along with that, uh, with this not being a partial commitment, but a complete, it's not just a step <coughs> in commitment. 
um, it is a full commitment. And that deals with, you know, the, the, um, the way that our, our culture, uh, and maybe many of you, ha- ha- think about with cohabitation or, or try, I want to try out all aspects of my relationship and then I'll commit to marriage. It's actually the opposite is supposed to be happening, where we commit in a binding relationship and then we work it out in all of the areas of our life. Um, the way that our culture tends to do relationships with, with uh, let's start dating and then let's live together for a while and then we'll consider marriage later, it tends to feed the consumer mentality. Because as long as I don't have that marriage commitment, I'll continue to see, are you going to meet my needs in the way that I want them to met? And then eventually if you've done a good enough job of meeting all of those needs in a way that's satisfactory, then maybe I'll consider committing to you in marriage. Whereas the Bible is saying, yeah, I mean, obviously dating is not wrong. We need to get to know one another. But it's saying there are certain things, and sex being one of, one of them, that is, is so powerful and so precious. It's such a joining of the two that's representative of, of giving our whole selves and lives to one another. The commitment needs to be there in order for it to be enjoyed in the way that it is designed. Thirdly, God's design is limiting because it's loving. It's limiting because it's loving. Three things here, really quick. Limits that God places on this because he loves us. First, he limits where, when, and the, the where, when, and who of sex. He, he defines marriage as between a man and woman inside the covenant of marriage. The Bible celebrates sex inside of marriage. Uh, one author even said it like this. He said, you know, in Genesis, when, you, when you, the first you know, two chapters of Genesis, you see man and woman naked, singing love songs to one another in the presence of God. I mean, th- that's crazy. But God is saying, hey, this is a beautiful thing. And at that point, sin had not entered the world, Right? So there was a celebration of this relationship, of this openness, of this wholeness in front of God. The reason that there are limits placed on it is because (laughs) sin has corrupted it. It's because sin has corrupted it, right? Our sin, our rebellion has has twisted things in such a way that God says, hey, now in this context that is the safe, whole context is where it belongs. Secondly, he limits Our eyes and our hands and what we call lust. Let me read it again. I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than the whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. What is he talking about? He's not talking and and commissioning mutilation. He's asking for mortification. He's asking for us to kill what is dangerous to the good thing that he's designed. He's saying this is not a, this is not a casual danger. If your eye is, is inflaming, is, is awakening these desires that can only be fulfilled inside of a marriage relationship, then act like, act as if you're blind. In other words, do what it takes to remove that from your sight. That's enticing you, that's calling you into um, the, 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 the acts that would issue forth from, from lust. He's saying the same thing with your, your hand. If your hand's causing you to sin, act as if you didn't even have a hand. And, and get out of that place that's tempting you. Flee. In other portions of Scripture talk about fleeing this temptation. And in other portions of Scripture, it talks not just the hand and the eye, it talks about the feet. <laughs> In other words, if your feet are carrying you somewhere that is leading you into this dangerous, destructive thing, then, then act as if you didn't have a feet, as if you're crippled. In other words, don't go there, right? He's saying act decisively and clearly. Get help. Do what you need to do. Pornography is something that absolutely destroys not just people as individuals, but our society as a whole. It awakens, it inflames, it, it distorts the views of who who people are, and what sex even is, is supposed to be like. It, it, it uh, allows the, the one piece of, uh, uh, of, of the, the marriage relationship without all of the commitment that's, in, in, you know, that's, that's required of it, that, that goes along with it. 
It shrinks the, it shrinks the marriage pool because the men and women that are, are, are immersed in it end up not wanting to or being willing to give themselves to the whole commitment and all the mess that that involves in relationship because they're just seeking that, that pleasure and they're getting it. He's saying, hey, this is going to destroy you. Run from it. Deal with it decisively. Thirdly, he limits divorce. He limits divorce. He's saying, hey, marriage is not a mere contract. It was also said of you, verse 31, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. He's saying, um, this is not just a mere contract. Listen, in the context he's writing to, divorce was totally one-sided in favor of the man. Um, and he could give a certificate of divorce if uh, his wife made him a bad meal that he didn't like. Um, if she lost, if he she lost the, uh, the if he lost the light in her, her appearance, all sorts of things were were all all they had to do was make sure and and give a certificate. In other words, go through a process. They were like at least saying, hey, at least go through this process so that then she's free to marry somebody else. Like. Um, in, in, in that sense, marriage was going to provide for her and her family. It was, it was, was more than just a, a luxury. It was vital to her, her survival, right? So he's saying at least go through this process, give the certificate um, if, if she's lost the, the light in your eyes or you're no longer wanting to stay married to her. And Jesus is saying, hey, that is not why wrote Moses wrote this law. That's not why God gave Moses this law in the Old Testament. It was because of the hardness of people's hearts the corruption to at least limit the rampant um, you know, divorce that was going on. He's, he's saying, listen, uh, marriage is, is, is a, it's not a mere contract. It's, it's, a, it's a covenant relationship. Um, the Bible, we could talk more about it. The Bible gives at least three um, reasons for divorce that are accepted. Adultery, abandonment, abuse. Um, the thing I will say to you as a congregation is that's one reason to really deeply consider membership in a local congregation. It's just because those sorts of decisions are really hard to discern. Am I in a relationship that is abusive? Am I in a relationship where there is really uh, grounds for, for abandonment? Am I in a relationship that my, my spouse has done something that is, is cheating, is adultery, um, and then is there a potential for reconciliation or do I have grounds? To, th that is not an individual decision. That is something that you need to have the family of God come around you, people and brothers and sisters that you trust to speak into that with truth and clarity um, and help you pursue. Because it is so precious, because it is so important. God's design is covenant over consumer. It's complete, not partial. It's limiting because of love. Now, Again, we just barely touched it. But let me talk for just a second of how does Jesus fulfill it? How does Jesus fulfill it? Um, in The Great Divorce, there's a scene that I ref referenced many times of uh, where an, a, a person from, um, from hell has, has entered into the heavenly country and is being offered the opportunity to stay. But on his shoulder is a lizard of lust. You remember that scene? He's got a little lizard there whispering things into ear of like, hey, don't do this. They're going to kill me. They're going to take me away from you. If you give yourself to, to this country, I'm, I'm not allowed to stay here and you're going to miss me. And finally, he allows the angelic, the angelic being to take that lizard and break its back and throw it to the ground. And he just, it hurts him. It pains him to let go of that. But he allows him to do it. And what happens is that, that, that desire, that seed of desire that was manifested in the lizard of lust becomes the stallion that takes him with speed to the heavenly country to be with his Savior. What is Lewis trying to do there? He's trying to say, hey, the seed of even something like lust is something that is in the desire is in you that is a God-given desire that's just been taken to corrupted, <laughs> wrong places and ends that are way too small for what you were made for. You're made for a marriage relationship with another person, and even greater, that that marriage points to a, a more full relationship with Jesus. 
with the lover of your soul that we sang about today. And so that's, that's what we want to talk about here. Jesus fulfills it. He takes us from lust to covenant love. He takes us from lust to covenant love. Lust is, is another way of thinking about it is, 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 is the same way we might think about uh, a sin like greed. Um, you know, greed is one of those things that it's, it's, a good, it's, it's a good thing gone wrong. It's the idea of wanting money or, um, or food or something like that and then having that desire uh, distorted in such a way that it just serves my purposes and I give all of my, all of my hope in it to satisfy me. Uh, the same thing with sex and illicit relationships. Um, if we look to them to give us love and affirmation and security and pleasure and joy that only Jesus can give, they are not going to satisfy. It says here, flee those things because it's better for you to lose one of your members than to go to hell. The word used for hell here is Gehenna, which was the garbage heap outside of town where they burned the garbage. So it was always smoldering. It was always stinking. <laughs> it was uh, a place that stood for unfulfilled longing and unquenchable thirst. So that was the image that was brought to mind when he would use this word for the people of that. What is he saying? If you continue to pursue this and inflame this, it's only going to, it's never going to slake your thirst. It's never going to fulfill you. It's only going to just increase that longing and never deliver, never satisfy, never quench. And so in John 3, when Jesus meets the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, she's coming there at a time of day where Nobody else would come because she's an outcast. And he engages in dialogue with her. And when he talks to her about getting some water, he offers a living water. And uh, she, when he asks about her life, she says, I don't have a husband. I've had, and he says, that's right, you've had five. And he offers her something that's going to satisfy her more than what she's been seeking to find in all of these human relationships that she's been through. And that have all ended in disaster. And that's what he's offering us. He's saying, if you try to find your satisfaction in human relationship, in the kind of love that only can be found in Jesus, you are going to be disappointed. Even inside of marriage, if you're looking to your spouse to be that, you are loading them up with a crushing burden they can never fulfill. The only thing that's going to satisfy you is giving yourself first to Jesus as your bridegroom. Last week, we talked about with anger, Jesus fulfills it. And the picture that he gives us to hold on to is the, is the picture of him as our reconciler. Remember us talking about that? This week, one of the pictures that is helpful to hang on to as we pursue the scriptures in this is Jesus as our bridegroom. Jesus as our bridegroom. And that is, it's, it's, it's kind of a scandalous picture, but it's all over the scriptures if you go look. Um, Ephesians 5 says, A man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. He's talking about sex. The mystery is profound. And he said, but I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. He's saying Jesus is our husband, our bridegroom. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, he says, I feel the divine jealousy for you, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as pure virgin to Christ. He's saying Jesus is your bridegroom. He's the one that's going to fulfill you like no other relationship can. In John 3, he says, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. This is John the Baptist. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. John the Baptist is saying, here he is. He's the bridegroom. He's the one we've been looking for. Matthew 9 says, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus says, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away and they will fast. What are you saying? I am him. I'm in your presence. And then Revelation 19, the consummation of all things. We read, hallelujah, for the Lord our God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. That's where we're headed. The picture of the church as his bride being prepared for and being brought to the bridegroom. We read passages in the scripture of Jesus as our legal substitute, and it's beautiful. As our sacrificial lamb, and it's beautiful. As our representative that can only represent rightly, and it's beautiful. 
But here, the passage that's going to, needs to capture our hearts is Jesus as our deeply relational and emotional bridegroom. What we need in order to combat lust and the adultery or things that would come from it is the power of a greater affection. And so you and I need to know Jesus, but specifically Jesus as our bridegroom. Let me end with this. Um, one powerful picture in the scriptures is Hosea, the book of Hosea. And Hosea 3 talks about um, the, the relationship that Jesus had with Hosea, his prophet, where he asked him to go and, and marry first and, and foremost a prostitute as a, as a picture of God's relationship with the people who had given themselves to, to lesser lovers. And then Hosea 3, he asked him to go back and pursue her again as she had, 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 had committed adultery with someone else, with another lover. And the picture that he gives is the picture that we might all identify with, when, especially in a topic like this, where there's so much guilt and so much failure and so much sin that can surround it. Um, and the picture is her on a, on a slave trading block, basically, Gomer. And it's, no, it's, it's as the auctioneer tries to, to see who will take this, this person, nobody's found that will pay the price. Like, not even worth a slave price. And maybe that's where you, f- you are this morning. Maybe you feel like, man, because of the things I've done, because of the teachings of Scripture and my inability to match up, I feel kind of like a gomer. I feel like I'm, I don't have any value. I, I've failed so miserably at this. Who could love me? Who could, who could help me? Who could, who could see my worth? Who would, who would ever want to see me as something valuable to pursue? But the end of that story is that Hosea goes, and while she's up for bid and nobody's bidding, nobody's buying, you hear a voice in the back say, I'll give something for her. And he pays the price to make her his own again. And he takes her home into this covenant marriage relationship. At great cost to himself, personally and reputation and all the other things he continues to pursue and make this one his own no wonder that's used of the picture of jesus as our bridegroom of one who would do everything necessary to say because of what i've done because of your relationship with me you do have value i will redeem you i will bring you home i will pay the price i'll make you mine So no matter how you failed, however you've messed up, no matter how you're wrestling with this topic and all the ways that it that it can can cause us to wrestle, the answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus. He's the bridegroom. He's the one that's pursued us to make us his own, to set his love on us, and then to set about to make us lovable. So let's run to him this morning. God, we need you. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us loving limits to celebrate something uh, like a marriage relationship and um, the, the, the benefits, the, the, the things that come along with it. Um, we pray that we would seek your way and not just the way that um, we have come to know or that our culture has sold us. Pray that we wouldn't settle for lesser lovers. We wouldn't settle for less than what you would have for us. We would pursue it in the right ways. Forgive us for the lust of our hearts for the failures we have in this area and pray that we would know your love for us this morning through Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. We'll respond now to the teaching of God's word through um, giving of our tithes and offerings and giving of our hearts in worship as we sing.